Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you for our worship service today. We're blessed again to have Pastor Liz Milner, the Executive Director of the CIC Ministries and the Facility Chaplain at the Women's Jail, delivering the message. Welcome back to worship at Bethel, Liz. I've got good news that Santa Clara County has moved back into the red tier. I will be meeting with the leaders of small groups wishing to meet outdoors on campus to talk about Bethel's COVID protocols and safe ways that we can meet. We're excited to have you back. Now, for now, we'll still continue to stream our worship services near and far. As usual, we have lots of things going on for you here at Bethel. I'm gonna have Amanda kick it off and tell us about activities for young children and their families. Good morning. Our children's ministries announcements are, Kid Connection Sunday School meets every Sunday at 10 a.m. by Zoom. Our third through fifth grade group meets every other Sunday normally, but we have met for the past uh, couple consecutive Sundays and we will meet today at 1 p.m. for games. So please join us. And then our parent fellowship time is at 2 p.m. also by Zoom. Please join us. Please reach out to me if you need anything. Take care, bye-bye. Thanks, Amanda. The last two weeks, I've been sharing an important announcement by Mark Evershank with some ways we can support the foster kids in our community. I'm gonna show it again today so you're all well informed. Share with us, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Evershank with Mission Outreach. These rolly bags and duffel bag don't mean that I'm going to be going anywhere anytime soon, but instead it's an opportunity for you to help out foster kids in our community. When a social worker comes to take a kid for foster care, Oftentimes they have nothing in which to put their clothes and personal items. Here's where you can help out, either by donating a new piece of luggage or gently used that you have in your home. I will be at Bethel on March 7th and 14th from 10 a.m. to 12.15 to collect them. Or if you'd prefer, you can bring it by my house and you can reach me to make that arrangement. I'm on the in the Bethel directory or by going to the ministries tab on the Bethel webpage. I sure hope you can help out. Have a nice day. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Also backed by popular demand is an invitation by Dave Lofgren about our in and about St. Patrick's Day event. Hello, we are St. Patrick's Day approaching in March and traditionally out and about has held a brewery outing around that time. While we are seeing light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, we are still not to the point where we can load up the bus and head out to local breweries. So this year, we're going virtual. Instead of going to the beer, we will have the beers come to us. We're going to take advantage of a virtual St. Patrick's Day tasting event being streamed by Rockstar Beer Festivals. On Saturday, March 13th, from 8 p.m. until 10. By signing up with Rockstar, they will ship out a box of eight beers and two whiskeys ahead of the event, which will be described and tried during the event. The About and About team will be hosting a Zoom meeting where Bethel attendees will get together, listen in on the stream from Rockstar, and also share our own conversations as we work through the samples. And we can also share information about the snacks we put together for the event. Signing up for the beer sampler is not required to attend the Zoom meeting. All are welcome to be part of the evening. Information will be out shortly and on the Bethel website, Facebook page, and in the newsletter with details on how to let us know you will be part of the evening. And for those who will be tasting, a link for registering with Rockstar to get your sample ordered. Hope to see you online for our In and About March event. I love how he's balancing the bus on his shoulders. Make sure to sign up right away so you can have all your supplies ready. Also, please join us each Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Zoom for our midweek Lenten services. For links and info about all things Bethel, check out our website or contact any of the Bethel staff. Now please join in our opening song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord.
please join me for the prayer of the day. God of glory and might, speak to us with your wisdom, that we might truly hear you. Display your majesty, that we might truly see you. Transform the chaos of our lives with the clarity of your call, that we might worship you in spirit and truth. Amen. Please join me in reaching out to someone you haven't talked to in a while and wish them the peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you. Today, I have a question for you. And this is a question that I would like you to answer it as honestly as you can. And it's also um, an answer that you can say to yourself or you can say it out loud. It's up to you. Okay, you ready? How are you? How are you today? All right. So I do want you to think about this. Sometimes when I am asked that question and I'm kind of in a hurry or I'm doing something, I usually say, good, good, I'm fine. And maybe that's not always really the truth. And I'm working on being more honest about that, about how I really am. So I really want you to think about how you are feeling at this moment. And then I would like to connect it to the season that we're in right now, the season of Lent and Jesus preparing for the time that he was to die on the cross, everything that he did in preparation. And right now what we're doing in pre preparation as we remember this time of him dying on the cross for us. And we are loved. We are so deeply, deeply loved that not only do we have eternal life because of Jesus, but we also can give these feelings to God. These feelings of whatever they may be. If we're happy, God loves to rejoice in our happiness with us. If we're sad, God wants to be there with us when we're sad. If we're worried, if we're confused, whatever those feelings may be, God wants to hear that. God wants to be with you in those moments. So one thing that I do, and I wanted to share with you today, is that I do a repetitive prayer. And this is something I actually do almost every night before I go to bed. I think of one thing that's on my heart. Maybe it's something that I'm really happy about. Maybe it's something I'm really worried about. Maybe it's someone I'm really worried about. And so what I do is I say that one sentence 
and then I repeat it. And I repeat it. And I don't repeat it because I think God didn't hear me. Oh no, that's not it. I repeat it so that I hear it and I feel it and I believe it. So I wanted to do some examples with you because I would encourage you to maybe try this during this season, especially. Okay, so this is what I do. So I'm gonna think of something that I actually pray for pretty often. And this is how I do it. Good and gracious God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. In your name I pray. Amen. So it's as simple as that. It's as simple as one sentence. And I, I feel a difference in my heart and I would like you to try that so you can feel that as well. And so some other examples could be, um, you're happy, you had a great day. And so you say, good and gracious God, thank you for this great day. And you repeat that. Or you can say, good and gracious God, I am really sad today. May I feel your presence. So these are just some examples of some repetitive prayers that you can try. And I do wanna say that, um, yes, prayer is so important and it's import important part of my life. But if you are feeling really, really sad and it's just something that's just kind of stuck there, I also do encourage you to reach out to someone. Um, you can reach out to your parents, a friend, you can even reach out to Bethel staff and we can help you find appropriate help. All right, so let's go ahead. Let's prepare our hearts and mind for our closing prayer. What does that look like? And what does that sound like? Good and gracious God, we know you are with us in the happy moments, in the sad moments, when we're worried about someone else, you are with us through all of these times because you love us so deeply. In your name we pray, amen. All right, remember you are loved and I'll see you soon. Good morning. Our first lesson is from Exodus 20 verses one to 17. It's where we find the 10 commandments. And God spoke to all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor every, any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our gospel this morning is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, 
and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he is raised up from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Here ends our gospel. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you virtually again. Last time I spoke here was around the election, I think, and wow, a lot has happened since then. I hope and pray you're keeping well, that you know the love and the presence of God close by you today. Today's passages definitely portray the side of God we can feel somewhat uncomfortable and even intimidated by. With the Ten Commandments, as we have come to call them, and Jesus' angry outburst in the temple, we come face to face with a God who has boundaries and limits and is not afraid to express himself clearly around them. The Ten Commandments may be one of the more well-known concepts in the scripture. Movies have been made about them, monuments erected, politicians have debated, and most people, whether they are Jewish or Christian or not, have heard of them. As you know, I work in the county jail, a place where most people have broken the rules and are facing the consequences of that. It is easy to consider the Ten Commandments as God's list of rules that must be kept, never broken, used to keep people in line and whipped out as a way to show us how far we fall short of God's standards. Almost the way the people I work with feel when they go before the judge, who reads out a list of charges and admonishes them face the consequences. But let's take a moment together this morning to consider to who and how these commandments were first communicated. These words, and note that scripture actually calls them words, not commandments. These words of God are spoken to a people who just three months earlier escaped from a cruel slavery that had lasted over 400 years. They'd been brutalized, subjected to cruel punishment, and had their every move controlled by overseers for as long as they, their grandparents, and their grandparents' grandparents could remember. To use language that we use in the jail, they are deeply and fully institutionalized. I sadly meet many institutionalized people who've been in and out of the jail since they were children and in many ways they feel that they belong in jail or prison and cannot imagine dealing with life on the outside. It's often sad to me but not surprising that many of the people I speak with who are about to get released are terrified of getting out, asking will I make it, will I mess up, how will I manage my life and will I have the resources I need to make it work. I'd almost rather stay here in jail, they say. And we hear that in the Israelites' story. As they cry out to Moses, their leader, we were better off back there than wandering in the desert with nothing. At least we had food to eat in Egypt. And it's to these people in this situation that God is speaking these words. These words on how to live in the world as free people not slaves, as people before God in their own right, not people owned by others and expendable. And we remember that God frees them from Egypt first, then gives them direction on how to live in healthy, flourishing ways. These are not commands to be obeyed in order to be liberated. 
These are words spoken to a liberated people on how to live in liberation. So often I think we assume that obedience comes first in order to please God, rather than seeing obedience as a grateful response to God's work of liberation. So let's listen to these words with the ears of those who first heard them, newly liberated, unsure how to make it in the world. God starts by saying to them, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt, have no other God before me. I liberated you, I am with you and I want to be your God. Don't return to the old gods, the gods of Egypt that you've been surrounded by for centuries. Don't be tempted to follow quick fix gods, shortcut gods, gods who look impressive but deliver nothing. I don't know if any of you have actually been to Egypt. I have when I used to live in Europe and those statues, those temples, those images of the Egyptian gods are incredible. And most of them were built by the Hebrew slaves who are now listening to these words. These would have been the very present, intimidating, massive visual images and nightmares of the Israelites who are now wondering if this Yahweh, this Hebrew God, who they couldn't even see, was leading them into the desert to die. Could this God ever measure up to what they'd seen in Egypt? For the men and women I work with in jail, the gods they look over their shoulders to in Egypt, the intimidating human shortcuts that seem so promising but deliver nothing. Those gods are often gods like addiction, codependency, violence. For you and I, what are the gods that we grew up around that loom large? that God says, do not put these slave masters ahead or above of me in your life. What might those gods be for you? Let's take another of the words of God to the newly liberated people. Remember the Sabbath day and rest on it. Work every other day, but on the Sabbath, you and your whole community, your animals, your servants, must completely rest and refresh. Now, Silicon Valley has its own unhealthy relationship with work. But think how this commandment must have sounded to those who were used to forced slave labor, to those who would be beaten if they hesitated whilst hauling rocks to build the latest pyramid. Imagine how revolutionary it must have been for them to reimagine work as an activity to engage in with energy and take pride in and to put aside and rest from. To be commanded not to work till they died, but to com be commanded to rest. God was rebuilding, restoring the people's relationship to work after centuries of abuse. God was restoring a sense of rhythm and rest, which is essential to a healthy, vibrant community. What about you? What's your relationship to work? Is it one of those activities you mindlessly slip into with the rest of society? almost without a second thought? Are we imprisoned in our relationship to work? What are the masters that relentlessly command us to keep at it to the detriment of our health, our relationships and our communities? Most of us, thank God, have not been enslaved in the way the Israelites were, but many of us are captive to ways of being and working that God longs to liberate us from. Ask yourself, and if you're really brave, ask your loved ones, 
what that might look like for you to take God's word to rest seriously. Let's look at one more word from God before we turn to Jesus. God says to the Israelites, honor your father and mother so your days may be long in the land that I'm giving you. The mothers and fathers of these Israelites were born and raised in slavery. Generations had been taught that they were nothing, came from nowhere and were going nowhere. And now God says, honor your ancestors. Honor those people who in their lifetimes knew nothing but slavery and misery. For those who are still living among you, your elders, give them honor and respect in ways that they did not know in Egypt. And those who passed away, honor their memory and lift them up, despite the fact that they were born and died in slavery. So that you all can establish yourselves as an honored people, honoring one another in new ways in the land I will give you to be in. So it's mind blowing for an enslaved people again, who'd never known honor, let alone their own land. Yet again, God is here restoring a sense of belonging, belonging to one another, belonging to place. And they had not known this before. We often hear this commandment as be nice to mother and father, but let's rediscover what it actually means to honor, to learn self-respect, to gain home and place and legacy. What does that look like for us, restoring a sense of connectedness to one another and rootedness in a place that God has given us? Many of us, myself included, are immigrants to the US, disconnected from many family or friends who live far away. My father-in-law died a week ago and I cannot be at the funeral, connected to our family and it's painful. Many of us lack that sense of connectedness, belonging. And yet here is God rebuilding that. And God says, start by honoring the people closest to you. What might that honoring look like? in your life? And how can you be rooted in the place that God has given you to live and be in? So for each of the 10 words or commandments that God gave, we can listen for what God was saying and doing for that newly liberated people what the heart of God was behind those words, what God was restoring and reframing and rebuilding and how God is doing that now in our time and place, reframing us all as the liberated, saved people of God. Which brings us to the gospel reading and Jesus's tantrum in the temple, overturning tables, spilling money on the ground, liberating doves and driving merchants away. What was this zeal that consumed Jesus that day? Why the fierceness, the urgency? Well, I believe many things were going on for Jesus, including his own sense of his impending death. But one thing seems really clear to me. When Jesus walked into the temple that day, he saw the world taking over God's sanctuary. Selling, profit, bustle, hustle, inhabiting the space in the temple, which, by the way, was the space set aside, the only space set aside to welcome Gentiles in to worship God. What God had given the people for as sacred space, what God had given the people to invite the stranger, the non-Jewish in to worship and be with. This gift of God, the world had crept into with its own cheapened version of religion, drowning out the peaceful place of prayer for all nations. 
that restored, healed, reframed vision of God's liberated people that God laid out in those 10 words to Israel was being dismantled and destroyed by the very people God had entrusted it to and Jesus wanted it back. Instead of worshiping God, the people were worshiping money and profit in the temple. Instead of resting on the Sabbath, the worship space was there being worked in and profited over and hustled through. And instead of honoring one another, the stranger, the loved one, they were seeking to use one another. The sacred space, the gift of life that God has given you and I through our salvation in Jesus is also under siege today from all sides. From the push to succeed, to be brilliant, to make money, to the temptation even in church, maybe especially in church, to perform, to be busy, to the temptation to fill our lives with hustle and bustle and trample one another in the process, we all have a version of it. What money changes have taken up residence in your spiritual life? Where have you lost that sacred, peaceful space where God invites you and others who are strangers into worship with you? Has your life of faith been cheapened? Is it shrill and not feeding your soul anymore? Maybe you and Jesus need to drive out those money changers. The heart of God from Exodus to John's gospel is to restore enslaved people to freedom, to health, to peace, to flourishing. May we, God's people, hear God's words and respond knowing we, really, we are truly liberated and we are invited to live fully before God and with one another. Amen. In Christ there is no east or west, in Him no south.
Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us humbly ask God for his mercy and grace as we pray for our church, our world, and one another. Holy Father, we come before you with thankfulness in our hearts for all the blessings you've given us. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we walk together toward the cross this Lenten season. We are reminded today of obedience to God, how you provided the Ten Commandments to Moses to guide our lives, and how Jesus cleared the temple of money changers and foretold to all who believe that he, the temple, would be raised in three days. We often fall short of your commandments and our faith and trust in you wavers at time. But we are filled with gratitude for your gift of grace to us. We thank you for those in our world who bravely continue to their work in the midst of the ongoing pandemic. We are especially grateful for medical workers and first responders, for doctors, scientists, and all those assisting in the distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine, and those spreading hope while administering those shots. We pray for healing for those who suffer from COVID-19. We say prayers of thanksgiving as Santa Clara County transitions to the red tier. We pray for teachers and staff at schools as they prepare to safely welcome back students in the coming weeks and months. Give us strength, wisdom, and courage to continue to keep each other safe with our actions until our community is vaccinated. Bless our Bethel community as we minister to our members, our families, and our neighbors. Help us freely sow seeds of hope with our compassion and our smiles, even if it's behind a mask. Help us prioritize self-reflection, reduce the noise in our lives, and take comfort in your boundless love. Gracious God, give us the wisdom to trust in you to lead a new pastor to shepherd us. We pray that our new pastor's heart will now be stirred feeling the Holy Spirit's call to Bethel to love and care for us and challenge us with the gospel. Anoint the call committee with perception, imagination, and discernment, trusting in you to be our guide. We lift up those in our Bethel community on our prayer list, including Elaine, Lou, Linda, Betty, Gail, and Shirley. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for Rick for another clean PET scan. As Rick says, this is the five year anniversary since chemo and six years since my lung cancer diagnosis. Feeling very blessed. We pray for the family and friends mourning the loss of Bill Duff, cousin of Sandy Hirsch. May the peace and comfort found in the promise of resurrection uphold all of Bill's family and loved ones. Now we take time to pray for other members of our family, our friends, and our community, asking for God's blessings or healing touch. For all these things, and for whatever else is on our hearts, we pray in the strong name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We now pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks always for your financial support. Bethel's ministries depend on your gifts, and we're blessed to touch the lives of many near and far. As we listen to this beautiful song by our All Bethel Choir, you will see instructions on how to contribute by mail or electronically through Vanco and Pushpay. Thanks so much for your support. Now please enjoy. Oh, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The stone that the builders rejected, the stone that the builders Now receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you the grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, grace to remember the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. 
So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in our closing song, I Am a Servant. Have a great week and we'll see you on Wednesday. i